It is wonderful to be here with all of you. It's heavenly in Helsinki. And I'm surrounded by a bunch of fellow creators. Isn't that awesome? And you know, we creators, we take big leaps, like this guy. Did you know, by the way, that if you want to go skydiving, you don't actually need a parachute? Did you know that? You only need the parachute if you want to do it twice. <laughs> and you're laughing, I hope, in part because as creative people, sometimes our feelings guide our decision making more than our thinking. Sometimes we uh, don't uh, mind taking risks. Sometimes we're just a little bit crazy. How many of you feel like you know you are a little bit crazy? Okay, well, after I'm finished talking today, you'll know that I'm plenty crazy. And, you know, you got to embrace that uh, part of ourselves. But, you know, we do take leaps as creative people. We are genuinely unconventional, and we don't mind being different from the mainstream herd of humanity. And I don't know about the rest of you, but you know, there comes a point in our lives when someone tells us that we're creative. And this happened to me. Uh, a boss of mine, uh, after I gave a presentation at the company, uh, he pulled me aside afterwards. He looked at me and he said, you know, Tripp, you're really creative. That was Steve Jobs. Nobody until then had said that to me, not even my parents. My parents, by the way, were both very creative, but they knew that you couldn't really make a living being creative. How many of you have had parents that told you, you can't really do that, you can't do that thing that you're doing? When I did my first game, which was a tabletop game, you know, I'm assembling it like it's an edition of Dungeons and Dragons. It's a football game, by the way, but the D&D equivalent. And I've got it all set up with some card tables, and I convinced my sister to help me pack up the games. And my mom's on the couch, and she looks over and she says, I had always hoped that you would do something more socially redeeming. <laughs> and just like all of you, I laughed at my own mother. Because, you know, I had some lived experience by that time, and I knew, yeah, you know, I'm different. I'm going to do things that she wouldn't have been willing to do. I mean, she had to grow up through the Depression, World War II, et cetera. And uh, even she was a creative person, but you're only allowed to do it as a hobby, right? And so it's very brave of people like us to do it, to make a living, and to be willing sometimes to be a classic uh, starving artist. So anyway, we are really accustomed to risk-taking, and fearlessness and courage, and that's how we take leaps. And I'm gonna talk about that today. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what's going on in the game industry today and where the, what the future holds and uh, how you can uh, deal with that. But I'm also gonna talk a little bit about uh, the, the journey of just becoming who you are and figuring out how to be happier while you're on, on the uh, work path you know, that, that you're on. So we take these big leaps, and we, we make miracles every day. I mean, this is the thing about innovation and technology, is that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, as Arthur C. Clarke, the author of Dune, said. By definition, if you're doing technology innovation, what you're doing hasn't been done before. Therefore, nobody actually knows how to do it. Every piece of software is completely unique. It's different from every other piece of software. You try to predict when you're gonna be finished with it, that's pretty hard. Has anybody here ever waited for a home to be remodeled and finished or waited for a house to be built or an office to be built? Anybody had, had that experience? And were they late? Yeah, they're always late. Well, you know what, they've had 10,000 years of experience building buildings. We've had a few nanoseconds learning what computers are, and then we're trying to forecast uh, how to do something that hasn't been done before, and we do that every day. That is pretty crazy. So yes, we make miracles. But we also crash and burn. 
So we've got these really big imaginations. We go off on these uh, explorations of fantasy. We try to do the impossible because we're risk tolerant. Turns out we have a lot of blind spots. We make plenty of bad decisions because we haven't gathered all the right information that we need. Humans do this all the time. They think they have enough information, but it's really their heart. It's really your intuition saying, oh, I want to do this. Oh, here's two or three reasons why that makes sense. Okay, I'm done. I'm not going to look any further. We're not always as much of a skeptic as we should be. And this is certainly how I made the worst decisions of my life. And I'm going to try to give you a little advice about how you can maybe dodge some of those bullets. So we can find that we have a lot of misery and suffering in the kind of work that we do, but that may lead to career success without happiness. You know, you may be miserable a lot, you may be anxious a lot. And, you know, first half of my career, I was really successful, but not really very happy. And I'm a lot happier now. You know, so it's, it's just something that I've learned about that I want to share. So let's talk about what's going on in the gay business today. We have seriously broken business models that are very frustrating. The way you guys would understand this is if you look at a top 100 grossing chart on any platform, you'll notice that if you look for a game that's come out in the last year, there's only going to be one such game on that whole list. The other 99 games are going to be versions of Call of Duty and Fortnite and uh, other mobile games and, and you know, basically things that have been around for a long time. And there's very high switching costs because if customers invest in one of those games and they're playing with their friends in one of those games, it's really hard to get everybody to shift over to something new. And you guys are trying to make the new things. So that's a challenge. Also, uh, the, the free-to-play business model, uh, it, 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 it is certainly very powerful. The word free, there's no word in marketing that's more effective than free. But then 98% of the users that download and try a, a game for free are going to end up ever spending any money in it. So that's, that's kind of a rejection. And one of the reasons for the rejection is that the platforms are these walled gardens, and they're taking the 30% share. But in order to do that, your pricing, if you're the developer, if I, if I want to get one euro from a customer, I have to charge the customer 1.43 euros. You then take 30% of that, that's 43 pennies. So that's what Apple or Android or Sony would get. And then I get the dollar that I was looking for. But you, as the consumer, had to spend 43% more money. You think the most recent years of inflation are bad? How about 43%? So that's, that is a serious, serious problem. I think it's one of the reasons why mostly consumers today on the internet, we, we play the biggest game there is in the world, which is figuring out how to not spend money. And we're really, really proud of ourselves. Every time we get something for free, like I'll be in the Apple News app and I don't subscribe to it, and there'll be this article, and I go, oh, that's an interesting headline, but I know they're not gonna let me see the story. So I just, I just bring up the browser and I Google search that publication and a few words in that headline, and now I'm just on the publisher's website who's, who's willing to let me see it for free. It's just, it feels good, right? You know, feel, oh, I'm so smart, I, I didn't spend any money. But this is a problem for us if nobody wants to spend money. Uh, meanwhile, the privacy situation the last few years, starting with Apple's IDFA change, it just made it really hard. You know, the 2% that spend the money, which on a really great game might be 5 or 10% of those that download it, uh, the whales, they, they spend a lot of money. I've, I've certainly uh, known many customers. I mean, the most famous mobile customers have spent over a million dollars in a specific mobile game. Pretty crazy. I know plenty of people that have spent tens of thousands of dollars. And I think even the, an average whale is going to spend at least a few thousand dollars. So we're building the industry really with a fraction of the total audience. And it's okay to have a bunch of free players because you know, they're kind of cannon fodder for the spending customers. But uh, it's hard to target them now because of the privacy changes. It's, it's gradually gotten better. AI is actually helping the ad tech companies improve that. 
Uh, meanwhile, we have these uh, other segments of the market that are emerging, like esports, VR, AR, uh, mixed reality, et cetera. And they're very, very small. Therefore, again, if you're a willing pioneer, you can get out front in something new. But right now, I don't think any of these uh, new markets have a particularly great business model. So in esports, uh, Amazon, the owners of Twitch, they make most of the money. So that's not so great for the rest of us. Uh, anyway, there's uh, uh, similar issues with uh, VR. Not everybody has it. I, I personally don't find a VR to be very compelling because it's very inconvenient. I think the most important thing in games now is the social value. And the number two thing is the convenience. And if you're not really sure about convenience and why it matters, Clayton Christensen, the guy that coined the term disruptive product, uh, he found in their later research that after the disruptive product, like the mobile phone, takes over with a new audience that got some new benefit, like mobility, uh, they found that later there's enough performance that they stop caring about getting big leaps in, in technology and performance. It's good enough. But what all industries do is they have their users and they say, okay, I've got enough performance. Now what I want is it for it to be more convenient. And why did you get a mobile phone in the first place? So you can make calls when you're not at home or not at the office. You want to be able to make calls more conveniently. And you, you'll notice how every data type now, you know, you used to read a big profile newspaper. You used to go to a movie theater with these really big screens. You used to go listen to live music or uh, 33 RPM LPs uh, with really great uh, sound dimensions. And, and now you look at it, the, the newspaper has shrunk down to you know, a tiny little mobile screen. You know, we're compressing everything, you know, so the music is all MP3. You know, technically, it's not really very high quality. But of course, the speakers on our mobile devices are so lousy, we can't really tell. Why are we, why are we settling for this? Because it's more convenient. So just keep that in mind. As designers, when you're making any kind of content, try to think about how to make it more convenient. So if I have to get an extra accessory, you know, like uh, uh, you know, a VR uh, face mask, if, if I have to uh, get something else, that's going to reduce consumption right there. It's an extra step that people have to take. But what I'm picturing is if I'm at home in my family room, uh, I, I, I want to have my snacks nearby, I want to have my drink nearby, I want to be able to wave and interact with my wife who might be in the next room or my kids or visitors. You know, the idea of having to have a helmet on of some kind, you know, and it doesn't really matter how weightless they're getting them to be. I mean, some of them aren't very heavy at all, and yet people still feel fatigue after 10 or 15 minutes. These are not uh, convenient things. So I don't mean to bash VR. I, I love the concept of it. Uh, I love Neil Stevenson, who coined the term metaverse, and love that book, Snow Crash. But we're really not there yet. Uh, meanwhile, I think the metaverse also has to have a very different kind of economy than what we have in the game world. Again, in the game world, you've got walled garden applications sitting on walled garden platforms. It's not open. Uh, they're not even really legit digital assets because if I buy a skin in Fortnite, I can't trade it with another Fortnite player. I sure as heck can't take it outside Fortnite and sell it to somebody else to use in another game. It doesn't even work that way. So basically, the, the, uh, these concepts associated with Web3, the reason they are compelling is that they allow us to have a digital uh, commercial world that's like the real physical world that we go out to in now, in the real world. And when you go out in the real world, you take payment methods with you because there's a pretty high probability you're gonna spend money. You're not gonna be one of these people that 98% of the time you don't spend any money. You don't need to have a payment method. You're always taking multiple payment methods because you expect to engage in some form of commerce when you're out in the world. The virtual world has to be that way too. And digital assets have to be real assets. If, if I buy a skin in Fortnite and then I, it only has digital value to me as long as I'm a subscriber and player of Fortnite, that's not a real asset. 
And if I decide to switch over because a friend wants me to play a different game and I'm gonna stop playing this game, I can't do what I could do in a casino. I can't go to a cashier and get cash and, for all my chips. You just can't do it. So we're, we're not really yet operating a legit economy in the digital realm, and we need to. And so a lot, a lot of the features of Web3 have that kind of legitimacy. So I buy something, I know it's unique, I know it's not a counterfeit, uh, there's different marketplaces where I have the freedom to buy and sell these kinds of items and, and uh, do things like that. And I, I think it has a big future. I know it's uh, stumbled a, a few times in the last few years. Uh, and meanwhile, the uh, metaverse, that probably a lot of it is gonna be a 3D immersive environment, probably without needing to have uh, a bodysuit and other contraptions on. Uh, it'll just be on a big screen on the other side of the room. Uh, we, we probably have more prototypes of a potential metaverse now than there are characters and uh, worlds in the Marvel character uh, universe. But uh, I would cite Fortnite and Roblox as maybe the best current prototypes of the metaverse. And you'll notice that in both cases, these are properties that have a sense of humor about technology. So Fortnite didn't say, oh, let's go make a better shooter. Let's have more accurate weapons in PUBG. Let's have more authentic military gear than Call of Duty. No, they said, let's have a big party. Yeah, there's gonna be some shooting, but we're gonna have people not really care that much about whether or not they win. We're gonna make it possible for them to play with their friends, to be on a squad together. We're gonna have big uh, rock stars come in and we have these big parties. So it's a very, very different approach that Fortnite took, obviously very successfully. And of course, uh, Roblox is a parody of a parody. I mean, basically, they're kind of the derivative of Lego and Minecraft. And again, not taking themselves too seriously. And a lot of the content uh, ref reflects that. I think there's a really big opportunity for more games to be uh, more involved in humor and getting people to laugh and, and be more lighthearted. And it's more socially inclusive. In Fortnite, there's less, I would say, uh, performance anxiety and pressure about being the winner. And uh, you know, I watch squads playing Fortnite, and one, one of the characters, one of the players will die, and the others will just kill themselves so they can all start over and be together again, which I find uh, really charming. I think you know, collaborating and having fun with your friends, that's far more important than whether or not somebody uh, wins. Okay, there's also some reason for hope because since 2019, 29% uh, of new uh, intellectual property, uh, I'm sorry, 29% of revenue has come from new original intellectual property. So there have been some products that, that have uh, broken through. So that's good. So these are issues that we, we have with the current business models. Uh, from a social and community standpoint, you know, th this is the thing that you should think about more than anything about, about uh, game design. And we now have a really mass audience. There's three billion uh, gamers. We've got about eight million people on the planet and about half of them are introverts. So we know we have four billion introverts. We can count on all of them becoming gamers. How many of you think you're an introvert? Yeah, the rest of you are lying. Uh, yeah, so uh, the introverts, we don't really know what to say to other people. Sometimes we have to plan conversations in advance. And what's really great, and I noticed this even as a kid, is there, if there's some context, something we can do together, like play a game, then the social engagement just happens on its own. I don't have to try. It's just part of that process. And that's a really great thing. So we, we've got the potential here to have uh, everybody on the planet uh, playing games. And when, when I started Electronic Arts and I started talking to the media about games, Atari had just imploded and everybody thought video games were over, kind of like the hula hoop was over. And they said to me, uh, you know, why do you think this is going anywhere? And, and I basically said, well, because in 50 years, all the people that don't play video games will be dead. <laughs> and we're almost there, we're almost there. <laughs> 
So everybody under 40 is playing video games. So yeah, we're, you know, this is a market that can't help but expand. So <clears throat> anyway, if you want to maximize this market, you've got to recognize it is a mass market, which means everyone is a customer. It's the men, the women, the children, everyone, OK? And uh, you know, again, they care about convenience. So what does that mean? Well, it means they're more likely to be using a device like a cell phone because it allows them to be anywhere. Also, they're likely to use cloud services. You know, it's like if you're in a hotel room and you've got a nice big display, this is where cloud services come in really handy. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't bring my Xbox to my hotel room. You know, so uh, the, the ability to play anytime, anywhere, on any, somebody else's screen, and just because I can get to the cloud, that's pretty nice. You know, and those of you that have consoles, you think you have a huge amount of hard disk space and everything, but every one of you knows that if you want to download one more game, because these games keep getting bigger, you're going to have to delete something else that's already on your hard drive. And it's like, oh, I don't really want to do that. You know, so it's, it's just gotten to a point where uh, everything's going to go to the cloud. I just think a slogan you can remember is the cloud is everything. You can see it happening already, right? There's all these services that we already depend on being in the cloud. Part of the convenience when something's in the cloud is that consumers don't have to worry about what version they have and whether or not they need to update it or how to update it because it's all happening in the cloud. Okay, then you have cross-play. And it was really great when we started having cross-platform development with uh, third, you know, 3D engines like Unity and Unreal. That was just a stepping stone to get to crossplay. Crossplay is of far more importance than that because it means I can invite a bunch of friends to play something. It's probably going to be free. There's no social downside for me. I don't have to worry about somebody wasting money on it. And we're going to try out this experience. And it doesn't matter if some people are on their phones, some are on PC, some are on different consoles. It's uh, crossplay is happening very rapidly. The very first cross-play game was Fortnite. It was the first time Sony had ever allowed the PlayStation players on the same gaming battlefield with Xbox players. And now we have hundreds of games that have that uh, cap capability. Uh, the other thing you want to consider about convenience is that not everybody has fantastic dexterity. And there's really, as a designer, you've only really got four dimensions of gameplay available. And they are skill, strategy, um, dexterity, and luck. And I'm actually a big fan of using all four. So for example, if you make a, if you make a chess game, all you got is strategy. Uh, you're also going to have some skill, because uh, the, the more somebody plays chess, they're going to learn move sequences and famous openings and recognize famous openings from their opponent. That's a skill. Uh, so. You know, obviously, we know that gamers get very skilled in any kind of game mechanic. Uh, that's one of the pleasures of gaming, is just knowing that uh, you're getting better at it and you're progressing and so on. And uh, at the same time, uh, you know, so we're talking a little bit about the benefit of, uh, you, you, you're, of, of having skill progression, having strategy so I get to use my big brain. And then the other two things, um, dexterity and luck. If there, a little bit of luck is involved, uh, imagine if chess was designed so that you had to roll some dice. Okay, now there's a luck component. I, I took your guy, but now I have to roll a certain dice total to, to have that be for real. And sometimes I'm going to win, and sometimes I'm going to lose that. So if we played chess, uh, I wouldn't always win if I'm a better player than you. Uh, if we play real chess without the dice, and you keep losing, you're not going to want to play with me anymore. And now I'm, I'm lonely now because I'm not with my friend. I'm not able to play with my friend. I enjoyed beating my friend, all of the above. So if there's a little luck involved, occasionally I'm going to lose. Every time I lose, I praise how well my opponent played. So I'm patting him in the back, telling me how smart he is, even if I think, yeah, you just got lucky. Meanwhile, uh, every time I win, I can say, oh, boy, I, I really got lucky. That's going to keep us playing together. So keep that in mind about luck. Uh, and then the, the, the last thing, though, is dexterity. Not everybody has great dexterity. Some people are just genuinely really clumsy, and they always uh, were, and they always will be. And then other people are like Olympic-class athletes, are always going to be great at it. 
uh, or certainly younger people are going to be better at it than uh, people that are old enough to start having their uh, senses uh, go into decline. Uh, I'm certainly one of those. I didn't have to wear these in the past. Anyway, if you design a game that requires too much dexterity, you'll alienate plenty of people. So, so if we, I, I, I personally find the preoccupation with shooters to be a little overcooked. They're very expensive to develop, and they uh, are really great for people that have insanely great dexterity, and there's already plenty of them. I, I would maybe try to make something else, but I would think really hard about having your gameplay based more on uh, the decision-making, because every human being knows how to make decisions, and we're all pretty darn good at it. This, this organ we have up here in our head, it's the most amazing thing that we know of in the universe. And being able to think and make decisions and have that agency, that's really beautiful. So these are all things that help out on the uh, side of uh, convenience. And, uh, and then finally, uh, the generations are changing. The, the next generation, they're called Gen Alpha. If you're like 15 years old right now, you're a Gen Alpha. And here's a comparison of the boomers. I'm a boomer and what percentage of time they spent on these different media types compared to the uh, alpha generation. So you'll notice that games have gone way up, and meanwhile, old-fashioned television viewing has gone way down. Otherwise, it's pretty much uh, not really that different. Uh, in, in fact, it's interesting that uh, even reading uh, has held up, although I'm not sure in this measurement if you ask everybody how many minutes you spend reading your phone, you know, it's, reading a book is one thing, whether it's you know, a, a Kindle or a real book, but we mostly read phones. We're reading text all the time on our phones, so there's a lot of reading still going on. Uh, reading is not completely dead, it's just taking a different form. But we see this change, I don't really consider it that enormous a change, but it's very favorable because we have the young people spending more time on games and they'll ultimately grow into people that have credit cards. Okay, future forecasts. Uh, we've got the governments pressuring the monopolies and starting to break down these walled gardens with their 30% taxes. That's a really good theme. Uh, if you uh, don't want to have to deal with that, uh, I, my opinion is that uh, the browser is a great opportunity. We'll come to that. It's 0.6, but uh, 0.1, uh, that's, a, that's a good thing to break down the uh, monopolies and the fact that they overcharge the way they do. Uh, obviously, the metaverse is coming, and uh, then, like, it, like I said earlier about humor and parody and, and uh, making it more of a social event to, to game. Uh, then we, let's talk about AI uh, in two different ways. First of all, already we have a lot of development tools that, could, that are using AI uh, to help development. And yes, that's going to change the jobs that are available in the industry there's still gonna be plenty of jobs in the industry because somebody needs to know how to really properly utilize the AI. So that would become more of a job requirement to understand how to use AI as a set of tools. And, and then, of course, we're also heading towards more real-time AI execution where you're gonna use it. you have to have to go through the same process of figuring out how to, how to, how to use it and what to do with it. But uh, instead of doing it in development and then having it create content that gets stored on an optical disk. There are now some methods emerging where stuff is compressed in a clever way and it's generated in real time in the game and maybe not even taking up that much memory or storage. So that's uh, an exciting opportunity. I, I found myself looking recently at a new game called Tiny Glade, which is kind of a UGC, user-generated content thing, where you can create your own town with, with have beautiful visuals. But I noticed that it was kind of dead. You know, so it's like a painting. And I thought, wow, you know, uh, what about sound effects? Uh, what about music? What about water that's moving? What about the sound of the water that's moving? What about uh, life forms and uh, accurate behavior of, between the birds and the, the trees? And there's just so many things that you could do in hitting a button where AI just takes over in this scene that you've created, this beautiful Animal Crossing type uh, situation where it all just comes to life uh, because of how you could leverage AI and have it be something really unique that you created as a player. Okay, coming back to the browser, like I said, I would. Uh, I'm, I just want to point out to you that with Moore's Law, 
the batteries get better over time, they get smaller, they, get, they, they uh, hold a charge longer, they generate less heat, so you can have smaller, them in smaller devices. We, we, get, we squeeze more bytes into memory devices that, that get denser, faster, you know, et cetera. Just all these things are getting better and better. And the same thing has happened as handsets have gotten better in the last decade. The browser's gotten better. The browser's faster. And you can now uh, look at uh, HTML5 games and recognize that, wow, I mean, they, uh, 10 years ago, there, there wasn't a single good-looking HTML5 game yet but I knew the, even then that there would be, and now, now there are plenty of them, you know, including high-performance shooters. But you can also use WebGL with the browser. So what that means is you've got this open 3D uh, format that allows you to uh, make calls to the GPU in the device. So my, my, my opinion about the future is, you can spend a lot of time trying to climb the hill you're on. You know, this attitude of, like, take that hill. Okay, we're going to climb to the top of the hill. Well, everybody is on the same hills right now. It's very crowded. There's only a limited amount of room up at the top. Better to take the next hill. Better to catch the next wave. You know, in surfing, there's a slogan, you know, you get knocked off and you get beat up like you would on that first hill. You don't give up, you paddle back out. You go get the next wave. So I believe browser crossplay with HTML5 and WebGL, I think that's one of the next waves. N new hills to go after, not really crowded. Right now, you can't think of a leading company that's doing that, period. So why can't that be you? When I started Electronic Arts, I actually thought we could become the leading, the leading company in the industry. Who thinks that way? Well, I had just spent four years build, helping build Apple. The year before I got to Apple, the company revenue, which was all from hobbyists, was $773,000, less than a million dollars of revenue. Four years later, after I'd been there for four years, and I'm not taking all the credit here, but we got it up to a billion dollars a year. We had the biggest IPO since Ford Motor Company went public in the early 50s. And, you know, created Apple as a really great uh, company. And the, um, the, you know, just the, the realities here about where things are capable of going and what you have to do to get ahead, you know, and again, you can just ask yourself, well, what would uh, Steve Jobs do? And if, you know, if you're, if you're looking ahead to climb the next hill, you may be the only person there and you're only really competing with yourself. And if you believe you can do it, then go for it. So what would Steve do and how would he approach it? I guarantee you that, number one, he'd be thinking about Moore's Law. He'd be thinking about what advances are coming and which areas. And uh, I'll give you a couple of uh, illustrations. When the Apple II came out, it was the first personal computer that really looked like the future. You know, I, I went to the West Coast Computer Fair in the spring of 1977, and every box is a big, garish, ugly thing with switches and lights flashing and looking kind of, of, kind of alienating. And then you go around the corner, and here's this tiny little booth of this tiny little Apple company that had about, I don't know, 20 people at that time. And you see the Apple II, and it looks like it's been beamed in from the future. And just right away, it's like, yeah, I want to go work with those guys. And I, I wanted to do a stint with a hardware company so that I got to, if I want to make games, I got to help get computers in home. So let's go work on that. And the Apple II was, uh, the, you know, the industry dominant product after that for the next decade. So, you know, this, this uh, kind of futuristic thinking, you know, they, they were doing that with the Apple II just in terms of how it looked, just the aesthetic of it. But they also were the first to have bitmap graphics. You didn't have to have it. Uh, but uh, having it opened up all kinds of possibilities for developers and even for Apple. And, it, and that's what kind of gave us that head start, realizing, okay, well, we want to have a different kind of user interface, different kind of user experience. I brought the first mouse into Apple. I brought the first spreadsheet software into Apple. And we're trying to figure out, again, how to do a next generation 
look and feel user experience. And that's when that whole process uh, got going. And all of it is a function of Moore's Law, because if you're going to do bitmap graphics, you have to have a lot of memory, a lot of pixels, more pixel density, even more pixel density, faster frame rates, you know, just all that stuff, generation after generation. So the Apple II was kind of a starting point for that. But if you look at Steve's decision making you know, later on, when he came back to Apple, uh, that was the time when everybody was uh, stealing songs off the internet. And the uh, CD-ROM had come along, but then they'd invented the, the uh, CD-ROM right once, you know, CD-R. And you could basically copy uh, music onto that. So at, at, you know, at that time, Mac wasn't doing very well. And Steve thought, well, hey, let's focus on having the Mac be a perfect piracy machine. Let's help people steal their music. And then after a while, he's going, hmm, I remember having a Walkman. And now all these songs are piling up that we've stolen on our machine, uh, I want to listen to them uh, on something like a Walkman. So he's just logically realizing, yeah, now we can make a Walkman that's digital. So that's where the iPod uh, comes from. And, and then uh, the years go by, and he's paying attention to the um, display technologies, and he's aware that capacitive touch displays are going to be a thing. They're, they're an example of organic liquid semiconductors that only came into existence about 15 years ago. And the uh, uh, capacitive touch, here's how it's different. It's like maybe if you think about it, maybe the very first time you ever used an ATM, it had a touch display, which meant you had to mash a finger into the display to get it to do something. And then it was real clunky and it took a while to do it. And then it gave you another few things to mash your finger into, you could really bruise your finger. That was not a capacitive touch display. A capacitive touch display, it doesn't really care if you even touch it. It is measuring the electrical charge between the display surface and your finger. That's why you're butt dialing all the time, by the way. When I put my phone in the pocket, I face the screen out. <laughs> If you face it in, your butt is going to be talking to the phone. And you can open it and go, shit, it almost bought me something on a website. How did it do that? That would have been like five steps. Anyway, uh, you know, um, capacitive touch is what allows swiping. Because you're, you don't have to mash it in anything. You don't have to really make these discrete, separate mo motions and movements. You're just in this flow experience irresistible, sexy, and then uh, they've just got generation after generation of iPod, and Steve is waiting for capacitive displays that are going to be affordable. He wants to do it in the iPod. He hates the phone business. He's already called the United States carriers the four orifices, which I would have loved to have called them because I was running digital chocolate at the time, and they were the four orifices. But if I said that publicly, they're not going to take any of my products. Anyway, here's Steve Jobs who can get away with saying it, and you guys wouldn't re even remember this, but uh, Apple finally made a phone, and they, they made it with um, uh, Motorola. Anybody here have a Motorola Razor? Remember that one? Really sick. Of course, wait a minute, we're in Finland. You guys saw that Nokia bar phones then. You wouldn't have touched a Razor. The Razor was a very sexy looking product, you know, flip phone, silver case. It looked almost like a piece of jewelry. And it was made by Motorola. So Apple thought, OK, we'll go make a phone with Motorola, and we'll cram an iPod into it. And it was called, instead of the Rocker, it was called the, uh, no, the Razor was the regular phone. It was the Rocker, R-O-K-R. And it was a complete dud, which showed that Steve didn't really understand the mobile space or how to do business in it. Anyway, so all right, that didn't work. Again, it's kind of a prototype. You know, prototypes are meant to be thrown away, and a lot of rockers got thrown away. All right, so what does he come back with? He's got now capacitive touch because he's thinking about Moore's Law, and now he can finally do it. He can make the kind of design he wants to make, and it shows up at the same time in the iPod and as the iPhone. And uh, many of us that, you know, the very first time we had any sense of the display, it's like you're looking at YouTube videos of people scrolling through album covers, and it's like, oh my God. And up until that time, here, I've been talking since 2004. I was calling the mobile phone the social computer. 
Facebook came into existence in 2005, by the way. So I'm talking about it as a social computer, trying to get people excited about what that might mean. Nobody's really doing anything about it. The carriers uh, don't really understand what I'm talking about. Anyway, and, and here, here comes the iPhone, and up until that point, like Nokia, you might remember the Series 60, uh, the Nokia smartphones, the only thing they did you know, in that time period, they just made the camera better and better and better. That's taking the hill. Everybody on that hill has a camera. Everybody on that hill can make their camera better. The way you need to think about the future, if you want to genuinely innovate, is to be aware of how Moore's Law is going to allow some new technology like capacitive touch that you can blow people away with, with a different experience that is just this flowing, swiping thing, and suddenly all you're doing all day long is playing Angry Birds. You know, isn't that awesome? So that's how Steve would do it. And, uh, you know, again, he was really into the notion of quality, almost like it was a religion, the, like the Greek uh, aretas, uh, or arete is how you say it, A-R-E-T-E. -E. The Greek philosophers talked a lot about quality. A wonderful book where I learned that term was uh, the uh, Robert Persig's, uh, the one where uh, they're on a motorcycle and they go all over uh, America. Um, where's my wife? Zan and the Art of Motorcycle Maze. Thank you, Lisa. Bravo. Anyway, fabulous book that's really a, a, a long ode to the meaning and value of quality. And many of you know all about this because it's part of you. And certainly Steve Jobs was one of those uh, people as well. And uh, basically, the whole culture of Apple was built around this mission of delivering a profound new kind of quality that would allow new kinds of experiences. Okay, so uh, I, I talked about Nokia not being prepared. How about BlackBerry, same problem. They thought, oh, you know, all these corporations are using our email, they're in our servers, blah, 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 blah. You know, again, they just thought, we're committed to having a mobile phone be a typewriter, <laughs> a tiny typewriter. That's, that's the past, that's not the future. The capacitive touch display, that took over like, like uh, wildfire. Uh, anyway, uh, that's, that's how Steve Jobs would think about the next thing. Maybe you can think about Moore's Law and it turns out you think about the next thing. Uh, I was thinking this way back at the start of Electronic Arts, so listen to this statement. This is from 42 years ago. It will not be long, I was wrong about that, before a computer game can offer the full sound effects of stereo, the high visual density and motion of television, the plot depth of books. So we are actually doing that now, but it was a long time. <laughs> Darn, you know, so you're going to be right about some things, wrong about others. And then also what I say in the plan is the opportunity the computer will emerge as a significant new communications medium for play, discovery, fantasy, and experience. Again, that's what we all do. We've been doing it for quite a while. And nobody really thought that way about it. I was calling developers software artists, saying We're, this is a new, new medium. And that turned out to be uh, right. And then uh, this is something for you to consider in your business plans. What is the business? And here's what I said at the birth of Electronic Arts. Do I talk about products? Like Apple would say, yeah, we make the Apple II. We make a, a personal computer. No. The business is a system a system for producing and marketing a broad line of advanced consumer and computer software. And EA basically created modern video game publishing because we looked at how the whole ecosystem had to work and what business practices to introduce. And here, this is a business plan that got funded by the best venture capitalists in Silicon Valley where I'm just saying, yeah, I'm going to build a system. They didn't ask a lot of questions. They're like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> What kind of system? How is it going to be different? That's not entirely true, but you can sometimes have that kind of uh, vision about the future. Uh, also, you guys know that uh, you're not going to get anywhere without hustle and effort. Uh, this, this car I'm kind of fond of because uh, it exemplifies what hustling really is. And it's a time when uh, I was a student and I was moving from one apartment to another and a friend uh, volunteered uh, to provide a truck 
that, was, that belonged to a friend of theirs to make the move. I didn't have that much stuff, so we could fill up one pickup truck and make it happen. So day of, I called him and said, how are we gonna meet up? And he said, oh, my friend says the truck's not available after all. Oh, darn. So we went to a truck dealership and we test drove a truck. Of course, nowadays they would have a salesman go with you, but they just let us drive away with the truck. So I'd already prepared at my apartment. All the stuff was out on the lawn. There's a bunch of blankets. So we just raced over my apartment. We were just throwing everything into the trunk, racing to the new place, throwing it out there, and then racing back, sweating. We'd been gone for now for more than a half an hour. And uh, we told, yeah, we drove up in the hills to see how it performed, you know, in, on, on uh, steeper ground, blah, blah, blah. That's the kind of hustling you have to do. Another time, I'm trying to get one of the biggest newspapers in the United States to write about the whole creativity series that Electronic Arts had developed, including Deluxe Paint, which was the dominant paint box uh, program in the 1980s and early 90s. And this newspaper wouldn't uh, give me an interview. So I flew across the country, all the way across the country, six hour flight, went to their office, and went up to the reception and said, uh, this journalist, uh, I have an appointment with this journalist at this time. And they said, okay, take a seat. And next thing you know, the journalist comes rushing and going, oh my God, I, I, I totally forgot. I'm so sorry. Made the front page. <laughs> just, just saying, I'm gonna get that interview. I'm gonna show up. Yeah, it involves, you can, you can see that there's a little bit of you know, borderline uh, moral ambiguity to hustling. <laughs> I'm admitting it. You gotta do sometimes what you gotta do. Uh, I did try to run away from the police once. It was a terrible speed trap near where I lived, and it was late at night, and why the heck would they even be out there anyway? And I'm going a little too fast, and I said to myself, I bet I can get home and into my garage, and the door will be closed, and I'll lose them in my neighborhood. It's a little squirrely. I was wrong about all of that. And uh, I pulled off to the side of the road, thinking, okay, I, I, I took a turn before my real street. They, maybe they'll go up the hill and miss me. They didn't miss me. <laughs> they pull up right behind me, a guy gets out, comes up, and I roll the window down. And he's kind of shaking a little bit because he probably hadn't had a chase before either, you know? And I just look at him, you know, I said, he said, he said did, 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 did you try to get away from us? And I said, yeah, can you believe it? That is the stupidest thing I have ever done in my life. I'm a responsible citizen and I run my own company. I can't believe I did that. I'm really sorry. That was really bad judgment. And they let me off. <laughs> they absolutely could have thrown me in jail for the night. So... Like I said, a little crazy. Uh, and then of course, aside from the situations where you gotta hustle, you better make the effort. Oh my God, it's all about the hard work. People have asked me my whole life, how did you do it, how did you do it? What's the main thing? Yeah, the effort. That's the main thing. You, of course, you better be going in the right direction. Just to talk about uh, the hustle and the effort a little bit at Apple, the, we, we had exactly two sales guys when I started there. And they had uh, this framed cartoon on the wall of the little cubicle they shared, and it's vultures sitting around where one of them gets tired of waiting. You know, they eat dead things. And these vultures saying, to hell with patience, I'm gonna kill, let's go kill something. That's, that's the attitude of a hustler, and those, those guys at Apple had that. And of course, you know, you gotta do relentless selling. This is what you guys are gonna have to do if you wanna raise money, get media coverage, you know, uh, hire the best people, convince the best people to stick around when uh, they're exhausted and burned out. So uh, you, you might know the book Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss. This is Sam I Am on the left. He's asking, do you like green eggs and ham? And this fellow says, I do not like them, Sam I Am. I do not like green eggs and ham. And the whole book is this little guy not giving up and waiting until he finally gets the guy to try it. And he, the guy lo loves it. So there you go. It's also about aptitude if you want to succeed in the industry. And I just want to share this story with you because these are people that are like some of you. The guy on the right here is David Gardner. The guy on the left, uh, Rich 
Hilleman. Uh, I hired these guys at EA. The one on the right was 16 when I first met him. I think he was probably 17 by the time he was hired. The guy on the left was hired when he was 21. Neither one of them finished high school. Neither one of them went to college. Why am I giving... I don't have a big organization at EA. These guys were among the first 15 employees. Why would I give two precious slots to people that really don't have any experience? The answer is, if you're going to take the next hill, what you need is the aptitude and the passion. They need to love what it is you are already planning on doing. They want to be in your tribe because they fit your values. And they've got the aptitude to figure it out with you and grow. So they start out in the most junior possible jobs you can imagine. The guy in the right ends up running all of Europe. He's an American. He moved to England. He still lives in England. I'm having breakfast with him in London tomorrow morning. He's running all of Europe for EA. He receives the OBE award from Queen Elizabeth. That's the highest honor that England gives to a foreigner. I hired him when he was 17. Rich Hilleman stuck around EA, also became the chief creative officer. These guys, uh, when, uh, when I first met them, they worked in a compute, one of the early computer stores in Las Vegas, and that's how they knew each other. So <clears throat> basically, uh, you, can, you, can, you can get there just with the aptitude. If you're trying to do something that hasn't been done before, experience is less important. At any rate, it all starts with a story. I'm just going to remind you of that because you are telling stories. Uh, every player journey is itself a story. And at the bedrock of humanity is story. We are built out of story. Without story, what do we do? Everything we're doing all the time is about some kind of story. It's in our DNA. Our DNA itself is the ingredients of story. So try to remember that. A lot of them, of course, uh, a lot of you love that. And it hasn't always been uh, maybe recognized that the narrative, the arc, the characters, uh, you know, that sense of place, etc. it hasn't always been understood that that matters, but it really does. It really starts there. And uh, that's why I want to just say now in my last few minutes that uh, you have a story and you don't actually really understand every part of it. And, I, and I, I'm only sharing this because I know this was true about me. Some of this may apply to you, some of it may not. But we're in the middle of a global mental health crisis. You know, and there's just a series of ancient questions that we might ask ourselves, like, would we like, would we like to be a little happier? Uh, why do so many people appear to be unhappy? Why is it considered normal to have a midlife crisis? Why do we feel shame? I'll give you an example that you wouldn't just go down into the town square naked because everybody would look at you and you would feel shame. You know, but there's a lot of things that we feel shame about uh, without actually consciously noticing the shame. But it's a big theme in, in human life because it's social. Uh, also, the failure rate of romantic relationships is incredibly high. Uh, we have blind spots that make it worse. And uh, basically, a lot of people are uh, mad, mad about things right now. So that's what's going on. You have to ask yourself, uh, where do you fit in with all this, and who are you? Uh, this is a uh, frame from the film Lawrence of Arabia. It's my favorite film. It won several Oscars. And it's about Lawrence of Arabia, who was a figure in World War I who had all kinds of identity crisis issues. And the famous director, David Lean, who won the Best Director Oscar for this film. Well, the film won the Best Film Award. There was a scene in the film where he's just crossed this desert. Some of his colleagues have died. He blames himself. He's a British officer who is uh, not doing what his, his officers told him to do. He, he did something completely outside that box. And people have died because of it. But he's got this really brilliant idea about how to turn the war uh, uh, in, in the favor of the allies. And so he's gotten as far uh, to the um, Suez Canal, and he's kind of stuck there because he's on a camel. You know, he doesn't really quite know how to get across. And this guy on a motorcycle putters by on the other side. He's a British soldier. And the soldier yells out, Who are 
you? And then he looks like this, like he doesn't know. Who are you? And I'm asking all of you that question, how well do you know the answer? Because David Lane, who won multiple Oscars, He didn't trust any other actor to say those lines. He said them himself. That's how important this moment was in the film because that's what the film was really about. Okay, so that's what I had to figure out for myself. And one of the things I learned is that 95% of what my brain is doing is actually unconscious. I don't notice it. If you think about it right now, you don't have that much awareness of what your left thigh is doing but now you're thinking about it. It's like, think of a polar bear, now try to not think of the polar bear. So I I got you all thinking about your left thigh, but now I can say, what about your right foot or ankle? Again, there's all this stuff that we do all the time kind of automatically, and we're not aware sometimes that it ties into our emotional state, and we're not consciously aware of the bad decisions that we might be making. So you have a situation like this where you're out doing some whitewater rafting, and it flips over, and you're in the middle of... uh, this white water, and it's really scary. And here comes a rock right in the middle, so you grab onto it. And now what are you gonna do? Are you gonna just stay there? You can't really stay there, and yet people do. People get stuck all the time, and they're kind of stuck in uh, what people call monkey mind, and it just has to do with the fact that there's this tiny little peanut-sized bit of your brain called the amygdala, which is where you experience fear. And when that happens, we just want to rush to fix it because there's some imminent existential threat. That's what fear is about. And then, of course, meanwhile, in the bigger cortex, you have a lot of anxiety. You remember all the bad things that have ever happened, even in all the the movies you've seen, all the bad things that happened to fictional characters. And we end up being kind of impatient. We don't spend enough time on the reasoning side. And then we misfire. Uh, and uh, sometimes suffer from fear of failure or imposter syndrome or even sabotage ourselves. And this has to do with mental models where when we were born, we had to give up a part of ourselves. This is known as the lost self because we have to bond with our caregivers and we have to do whatever they want us to do. And so that would include uh, perhaps needing to be stoic if our parents are not showing a lot of affection and positive emotion and they're not holding us and smiling at us all the time. So we learn to be kind of tough about that. And that becomes a false self, that we're pretending to be a tough guy. Uh, Now, uh, other people, by the way, that have gotten stuck, uh, you might uh, appreciate this quote by a famous philosopher, Carl Deutsch. We are all torn between the will to live and the wish to die, and the wish to die becomes strong when we are no longer willing to continue to change. We are all challenged to change all the time, but just sometimes we can't keep doing it. And this guy, Hamlet, also uh, had the uh, same feeling, to be or not to be, and uh, his indecisiveness caused his uh, betrothed to die, among others, including himself. So we do get stuck, and that's why these famous stories like Hamlet are told and are famous. Uh, Here's a guy that grew up needing to be a tough guy because his family wasn't that affectionate, so he's projecting more of a tough guy, stoic personality. He finally is in the best relationship of his life, and his girlfriend leans in to hug him, and he pulls back. He kind of resists the hug because in his family, they don't do hugs. So she then gets upset with him, and that is emotionally triggering for him because it's triggering his wound from childhood, And then he gets angry, and it's like a gun being fired, and the bullet comes in and does the damage, but it has no power of its own. The power comes from the gunpowder. The gunpowder is in your psyche. The gun has a hair trigger on it so that it takes almost no effort to cause that mechanism to explode the gunpowder. We do this regularly. If it's not anger, it's something else like sarcasm. I'd be willing to bet sarcasm is really popular in Finland just based on what I know about the Finns I know. I've been coming here for 20 years. I love the sense of humor. Uh, I remember we, we gave a company award uh, periodically and we did it in our offsite here. And the guy that won the award comes up and says, it's about time. <laughs> so that's a form of, what he said was a form of sarcasm. 
And sarcasm, a lot of times people think they're being funny when they're not really being funny. They're, they're just masking uh, what's really anger. And this is because, you know, they're going into that little tiny peanut, the red peanut in the middle there of the screen, the amygdala. Uh, meanwhile, you've got this other part of the brain called the hippocampus that isn't functioning until you're about three years old. So from the time you're in the womb to being three, you don't have a videotape library or photographic gallery of everything that's going on. Plus, you didn't understand it anyway. You're just a baby. Uh, all the adult world, the culture, the family, everything, the technology, uh, social conventions, you don't understand any of it. You're going to misunderstand some of it. There's going to be trauma involved. Like if you're left alone in a room and expected to fall asleep, even if you're crying, that's going to be tra uh, traumatic. You're actually going to spend the whole time thinking that you're about to be eaten by a leopard. Why would you think anything else as an uninformed baby? But you won't be able to remember this later in life. So you guys don't really know what happened between zero and three because that's not activated yet. But if you think about what you remember from age four, five, six, whatever, it's probably kind of like that. I mean, if, if you had parents that were doing things that hurt your feelings as a five-year-old, they probably did even more uh, uh, trauma damage uh, earlier. These are the things that people don't know about themselves that well. If you remember the film Inception, they go into a guy's brain and they're going down to his unconscious mind where his ego is. And this is how they picture the unconscious mind. It's a massive fortress. And there's all these guys running around in uniforms with guns. And uh, that's what we're dealing with is all the things that we don't realize are going on in our unconscious mind that have to do with uh, ancient trauma that we don't really know about. And of course, we now live in a world that has lost its village. And you go back about 150 years, everybody's in a small town, a tribe, a village, and you know everybody else. And uh, those places are pretty much just post postcards of places where not even everybody is living anymore because there's no jobs. And that's unfortunately the world we live in. You know, we have suburbs, we don't know our neighbors uh, that well. Uh, we're, we've kind of turned into this. Uh, this is a bunch of kids at a school event, I think, in America. But you notice, like the Matrix, they're just all preoccupied with their phone. You know, we tend to do that. Anyway, you can do better if you're a little bit like Buddha, who basically says, don't get too attached to outcomes and kind of let go of things that you don't have control over. Ath the great athletes do that as well. They don't think about whether or not the media is going to choose them to be the most valuable player uh, or the best athlete. They, they just know that whatever it is that they can execute physically, you know, the, 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 the mechanical movements they have to repeat, that's what they have to focus on and not, not get distracted by anything else. So we can do that too. There's a whole discipline these days called emotional intelligence. Uh, you could check this stuff out at castle.org, uh, a, a leading organization that uh, I developed a game with. And it's these five major categories of uh, like self-awareness, self-management, uh, social awareness, relationships, and decision-making. Uh, nobody's really been trained in this. You know, there, uh, when uh, uh, Robert Goldman wrote the famous book about 30 years ago called Emotional Intelligence, he just went around and talked to the early practitioners of it, and it turned out that later on, my children would all go to the school that he featured in his book. But there were very few schools like that on planet Earth. They're, they're only beginning to be more schools that teach this. So most of us don't really know it that well. We don't uh, understand how to use these disciplines and practices. And uh, so here's what happens is that you're on holiday and you're expecting to have a really great time and the first night you drink too much and so now it's the next morning and you're hungover and you stagger off to breakfast and you're starving and uh, you pick up a chocolate eclair and you're just about to take your first bite into it and then this happens. And gosh, what are you going to feel about this seagull taking your breakfast? How is that going to feel? And the answer is, it's going to be, actually, something happened there with that slide because it's supposed to have 10 things on it, not five. There are, there are at least 10 different emotions that you would go through. And even at, you know, after you get a sadness, there's things like embarrassment and shame because you're, you, look, you look really stupid and eventually you might get angry, uh, etc. 
And this, this is what emotional intelligence is about, is being aware of your feelings, and if they need to be managed, having a toolkit of, of uh, practices and ways of managing them. And this is the thing, is that if you don't like the way things are, change your mind. And there are different ways of doing that. You can do it with chemistry, you can do it with uh, psychology. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of reading and research and taking tests. And I personally found it really useful to have a really great uh, psychoanalyst that uh, helped me figure out what happened in my uh, early life. Uh, I was also taught tools like cognitive behavioral therapy, which I think is a really practical, useful tool. You don't, in my opinion, and I'm not trying to give you medical advice, but my opinion is that you can read about CBT on Wikipedia, look at cognitive uh, distortions, and figure out for yourself how to, how to practice some of it and notice it when you're distorting things, because we exaggerate all the time and it gets us into trouble. So that's in the psychology aspect. Then we have physics. You go out and get some exercise, do some cardio. You'll get your breathing going in a way that is beneficial, just like it is if you do meditation. Uh, I, I do that. I, I do many of these things. And of course, uh, it helps to know about your genetics, because sometimes you have uh, specific hormones that you just don't have enough of and that helps you decide what supplements to take. But at any rate, I just encourage you to be courageous and curious about yourself. And there's a difference between wisdom and practice in that your ego is just telling you stories. Uh, wisdom, I can teach you arithmetic and you're gonna remember how to do it. Practice is something you have to just be consciously aware of doing all the time. And the more you do it, the more you will get comfortable doing it regularly and having it just, just happen. Anyway, the end of the world is coming. It could be next Tuesday in America. <laughs> now, a lot of Americans are planning to leave the country, depending on what happens. Uh, anyway, it's a scary time. This is a real unretouched photograph. This tornado is coming, and the wife of this man who's mowing his lawn took this picture. But yeah, the end really is coming, and that's about how oblivious we are about it. And of course, they've had some fun with it. But yeah, what are we gonna do about the state of affairs that we are in? But again, you guys are about making magic and doing miracles, and I'm just gonna remind you of what Marianne Williamson said about you. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond all measure, and we're just not exactly sure what to do with it but I think you guys know what you can do with it in the game industry. And I wanna remind you that we live in abundance. It's kind of crazy how abundant the world is that we live in. In this place that we get to be in, planet Earth, oh my God, what an incredible place. I mean, we know about over 10,000 exoplanets, none of them are anything close to being as fabulous as Earth. How about this form that we're in? We're the most advanced life form. Thank God it's not 70 billion years ago. We'd all have been stomped out already. So here we are in this place, in this form, in this time. And that's something to really feel grateful about. And, you know, I love this picture that they took from the moon. And when we look out from Earth, our little blue dot, we see the Milky Way but we're not looking at it, we're in it. And we are stardust, literally. That's how we got created, that's how we're gonna become uh, a later, in, our, in whatever later form we take after death as humans. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, I really am delighted to have had the opportunity to speak with you today. I've run eight minutes and 47 seconds over and I don't care because they'd have to come out and just cut, cut the mic and drag me off. That's, that's how I roll. And I just want to say, do or do not. Thank you. <laughs> that way. <laughs> Hello, Trip. Hi, uh, I can, the transfer I can take of the clicker. I can take the clicker. Thank you. Um, as you know, uh, I'm pretty sure that you're well aware that in addition to sarcasm, there's quite a lot of other great things about Finland, <laughs> such as the uh, long and dark winters, or the bright and short summers, 
or sauna, uh, ice Definitely. hockey, Santa Claus. But there's one special thing that we would like to give you as a gift, as a fond memory of Finland. Fabulous. It's our favorite Finnish juice, a box of trip juice. <laughs> All right, unfortunately we have no time for Q&A, so give a round of applause for Trip Hawkins. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Thank you.